Welcome, everyone. This is our March 2017 Warning Decision Storm of the Month. Use of the in-car ensemble cam in setting expectations for a significant severe weather event. And you're going to hear lots of different elements about this event. This is presented to you by Ray Wolf from the Quad Cities WFO. Next slide, please. Thanks, folks, for taking time out of your busy schedules to listen in today. So we'll review this event from a year ago, actually a year ago to the day. This is March 15th, 2016. And in looking over the event, we'll talk about how the uh, NCAR cam set us up uh, for anticipating the proper weather, which led to uh, proper staffing decisions. I'll review the event uh, as a short, intense event, rather high impact, occurring mainly in the metro area here. And then we found through the post-event process uh, some opportunities that existed there that I want to share. Uh, this picture on the lower right is not snow. It's actually uh, hail covering the ground from one of the supercell storms in the southern part of our CWA. And there's a radar image about 031Z there across our CWA in eastern Iowa, northwest Illinois, straddling the Mississippi River. We had six tornadoes between 2330 and 0130Z. Two of those six were EF2s. One of them occurred in the Quad City metro area, hit East Moline, Illinois. Uh, we Specifically, we had four tornadoes in and near the metro area in a 25-minute period. And the storms were fast moving, moving about 50 miles an hour. So a very intense event. And what we found with other events uh, these fast-moving storms sort of add another layer of risk uh, to the scenario. We've had a couple of fatalities result in past events from people who were outside preparing for the storm, moving equipment indoors, and uh, anticipating they had more time than they really did and got caught in outbuildings. Uh, so fast-moving storms are increased risk we play up. Some of the other impacts, this was an evening event here in the metro area for folks not familiar with the Quad Cities. Uh, the towns are Davenport, where the office is located, uh, Bettendorf on the Iowa side of the river, and then Rock Island and Moline and East Moline on the Illinois side of the river. The upside from this early evening event was that uh, people were engaged with TV, and we were engaged with the TV folks via NWS chat. So the communication uh, all the way along was rather effective, and we heard that from a number of folks uh, in damaged homes who had uh, seek shelter based on the warning. Even though the event was uh, mainly after sunset, we still received good spotter reports, both in the metro area and in the rural areas, which was very encouraging to get good reports when it's dark out. Now, we looked at the NCAR convective allowing model for the 15 March 0Z run, so it was 24 hours prior to the event. And just a couple little tidbits about the model. It's a WERF ARW version. The ensemble has 10 members with a 3-kilometer grid spacing and is run through 48 hours. If you want more information, there's a web link on the bottom to dig into the details. But... Uh, I want to make the point here that while we use the NCAR cam, uh, there are certainly other convective allowing models out there that provide good quality guidance, the HER SSEO and high res WORF versions. This just happened to be uh, the model we latched on to uh, that helped really focus us in on the event for this day. So to start off with, Here's a zero Z ensemble mean one kilometer reflectivity. And going back to the BAMX field experiment on QLCSs several years ago, one of the first things that came out of uh, that experience, uh, which was one of the earliest efforts with uh, the convective allowing models, is the use of the reflectivity and how it helps us uh, diagnose mode, uh, whether it's supercell or a linear type mode. Uh, that was one of the early findings. And even though the cam output might not necessarily be 
uh, precisely accurate in time and space, there still is a lot of utility in seeing what the reflectivity structures look like. And in this case, in fact, at zero Z, uh, the ensemble mean pretty much uh, nailed the event pretty accurately. Uh, but the neat thing about the CAMs are the uh, some of the more convective specific parameters the model puts out, and this is the hourly max updraft, and we see the ensemble spread. See the largest cluster is really here along the river, a little bit of, of spread, but uh, certainly the message coming from the model is that at zero Z, we're going to have some pretty strong updrafts along the Mississippi River. And then looking at a, a probabilistic output of the two to five kilometer updraft helicity, we see uh, again a, a consensus of the model showing uh, strong rotation ro potential for rotating updrafts along the river. In fact, everything in yellow is 70% or higher. So the uh, model ensemble mean provided a lot of useful guidance to help us anticipate uh, the sort of storms, strong updrafts, rotating uh, supercell type environment. And looking at the output in a time series is also pretty informative. And these, uh, the ensemble mean is the black line, but also on top of it is the box and whisker charts that show the distribution of the individual members of the ensemble. And this top graphic here is a surface-based case cape. So we see uh, both a, a diurnal increase in SBK prior to the event and ahead of the uh, cold front. And then at zero Z, a little bit of uh, uh, all the, uh, quite a bit of spread in what the SB Cape values were forecast to be at zero Z. But the takeaway message still is, even if you look at the lower end here, at the lower likely members, you're still in, in an area with like 250 joules per kilogram of SB Cape. And as many of us has seen, in these high shear, low cape scenarios. That's plenty of cape to spin up some tornadoes. Uh, looking at the bottom graph here, the updraft helicity, we had the warm front with some convection come through earlier in the morning, and that's reflected by this short maxima here. But then the, the peak, again, occurring uh, with updraft helicity right at zero Z, a little bit of dispersion early on that might have suggested uh, the begin time uh, was not is, is precisely indicated, but the peak at zero Z uh, is really what what we keyed on. Uh, several years ago, like many of you probably have too, we redid our severe weather operations plan primarily to deal with the uh, increased communications associated with social media stuff. But we also did some other things with how we pair up forecasters during warning operations. And this fit our level four uh, scenario complex severe where we have two warning teams in addition to uh, all the other typical uh, positions, uh, including a number of communicators. And this is a diagram of our operations area and how we're set up. This is something we just changed about a year and a half ago. and. Uh, we have our primary warning position person here in the dark blue area, and they have an assistant. Our second uh, warning person here, and they have an assistant. A DSS person off to the right. The coordinator floats around uh, the setup here. And our comms people are complementary sitting on the right side. And then we have a short-term uh, and meso person providing support here. I should mention our warning assistants do a couple of different things to support the warning forecaster and to allow him or her to keep their eyes on the radar. Uh, the warning assistants also have access to GR analyst and the importance of getting two sets of eyes on the radar. Uh, we've seen payback a number of times. They'll also monitor the mesoscale environment, so we do have a little bit of overlap by design on monitoring the mesoscale environment. And they're the ones who uh, are on NWS chat primarily, so we can have quick interactions with emergency management and the TV media. 
and they also act as an interface with the uh, with the communicators funneling reports uh, to the proper uh, warning meet, warning mat. So to quick a quick overview of the event, it's a pretty classical uh, type severe weather setup. Uh, in the upper left, 250 millibar jet, strong diffluent, which was in fact a strongly divergent area through the upper Midwest. At 500 millibars in the upper right, a progressive negatively tilted trough. In the lower left at 850 millibars, uh, closed 850 low, moving right on top of the area. And then at the surface, uh, the triple point actually uh, right on top of the CWA as the surface low uh, came into the area. We did a special sounding at 19Z, and at that time, a couple hours before the event, we already had MU capes up to about 275 joules per kilogram, uh, which was forecast to increase, of course, during the day. The shear profile was looking pretty good, the turning indicated at the hodograph, and then that was also forecast to uh, increase during the day. So the sounding gave us confidence that we were on track to what we were anticipating. Uh, 23Z, the SPC mesoanalysis here, the surface base cape in the upper left, we see an instability axis arching toward right into the Quad Cities area, actually. This is a 1,000 joules per kilogram line, so we're really uh, below a 1,000 joules per kilogram. But note, uh, a good deal of the event occurred in the Cape Gradient area, and how often do we see that? On the shear side, a uh, little question shear values. This is effective shear we utilize because of the lower top nature of the convection we expected, uh, but still sufficiently high for, for supercell storms. Looking at some of the uh, other parameters that focus a little bit more in on on tornado potential, zero to three kilometer cape, a nice nose up the Mississippi River Valley into the Quad City, so good low level cape there. Uh, the LCL heights uh, well below uh, well below a kilometer over the Quad Cities. Low level shear here in the lower left, uh, above 20 knots, and the Sig Tor parameter was uh, just over one in the Quad City area. So a lot of the SPC parameters uh, supportive of the tornadic environment in addition to the larger scale synoptic background. Take a look at where the tornadoes occur. I mentioned we had six in our area. Lincoln over here near Peoria also had a couple. This EF2 is a fairly long tracked one down here. Here's the EF2 that came right through the Quad Cities. A couple EF1s and uh, I'm sorry, a couple EF zeros here, and then another EF1 further north. And looking at the low-level rotation tracks from the MRMS data, we see each of the tornadoes was co-located uh, with a, a fairly strong rotation track. In fact, we'll take a look at this one up here near McCausland, spun up very quickly, uh, but all of them occurring within rotation tracks, but noting that not all rotation tracks resulted in tornadoes. So we'll take a look at a couple examples here, and this is the uh, tornado from East Moline, which was an EF2 and, and moved through uh, a populated area. Reflectivity, uh, not too impressive, but we go down, and this is at a half degree at the spectrum width maximum, and we see that here, as well as the boundary associated with the storm wrapping back in. And the circulation here, uh, the storm relative motion and the CC are at 0.9 degrees. And this is one of the things we talked about actually at the BOECO workshop in St. Louis last week, but uh, has been something we've been pushing hard for a long time, is when you get these storms close to the RDA, you really have to look up at 0.9, 1.3, maybe even a a little higher to see the sort of uh, circulation you might be expecting with the storm. In this case, the half degree beam was probably undershooting or close to undershooting cloud level. So we see a nice tight circulation uh, in the velocity data here in the upper right, 
and also the beginnings of a TDS that eventually um, expanded in height to uh, up above about 10,000 feet. Now the McCausland tornado just northeast of the radar was rated EF0, but it occurred right where you'd expect in the break, in the pattern, break in the reflectivity pattern here. Uh, circulation was just off the charts. The rotational velocity was in excess of 50 knots. It was not gate to gate, and this is one of the things, I think especially for some of the forecasters whose experience takes them back to Ford bit days, that they might occasionally have challenges with, is that you can have uh, pretty decent tornadoes and not have to have that gate to gate shear, especially when you're so close to the radar. Uh, we see a spectrum width maxima here and also an indication of the boundary and a very weak TDS. In fact, we had some discussions whether this would be uh, observable in real time. Uh, I don't remember operationally that we did, but I would say even just looking at it here, it barely separates itself from the noise. So even if you are close to the radar, uh, depending on, on data quality, you may or may not see a TDS. In addition to uh, what the tornado hits, because we've seen a number of cases that the land surface is a significant factor in, in the nature of what the TDS does or doesn't look like. So what are the takeaways on this? Certainly uh, the NCAR model provided some excellent guidance uh, within the context of a, a strong synoptic system and the guidance provided by the synoptic models. So I, I think the philosophy here is to sort of slip the CAM output into the context of what the synoptic models are saying to make sure there's good congruency uh, between the two. Uh, the convective-based fields were really useful at, at giving us a picture of what, what the uh, event was going to look like, and this led to uh, our staffing to make sure we had sufficient numbers. And this is a case where we did deliberately put our best people in the best positions. And I kind of liken this uh, is to the manner and the way Joe Madden manages the Cubs. If you're in the middle of the season, you know, you're moving players around and giving them experience and, and getting them uh, spun up to learn different positions and whatnot. But when it's game time against Cleveland in the World Series, you definitely want the right person in the right spot. Uh, we also, our warning forecasters routinely work in pairs. Uh, we think it's important to have a couple sets of eyes on the radar at all times. Moreover, this provides an opportunity for less experienced forecasters and new interns to gain experience in the warning mode. Uh, while not having the pressure of actually have to make the decision. In fact, in some cases, what we've done is in the middle of event, we'll switch the warning forecaster and the assistant to get the intern uh, a chance to work some severe weather. Another important outcome is that workstations are co-located to facilitate cross-team collaboration between the two warning teams, and that's very important, I think, to have uh, the ability to discuss back and forth and even be flexible when we sectorize, because sometimes an initial decision made as to how to sectorize might not work out as well as, as we find while the event is unfolding. And we need the flexibility to be able to change that and to communicate that quickly uh, on the fly. So execution. Of course, that's always the end game, but one of the things, and I'll make a push for our training program, is we need to be able to find a way to practice this type of event with the full staff. Uh, we don't get these type of events fairly often. Uh, over the course of a year, even a couple of years, not every staff member gets to participate in working such an event, but yet these are the big ones that we uh want to be especially proficient at. So we need some way to do a, a whole office simulation. On the post-event storm survey, of course, storm surveys are critical for the climate or logical record. And we know uh, 
with these sort of tornadoes, uh, whether supercell or high shear in the high shear low cape environment or the QLCS ones for the, for that matter, the determination of tornado versus wind damage can can be challenging, but it's very important to get that right for the climate record, uh, which is also the basis for for further research, and of course for verification purposes too. But also some other aspects of storm surveys that have value as uh, a public relations aspect. Uh, I've been doing these valley for near on 30 years now, and I've never had a bad experience uh, interacting with somebody whose house has been damaged. In fact, they seem appreciative that the NWS takes time to come out and talk to them uh, about about their situation and, and see what's happened to them. And, and most of them really uh, appreciate the opportunity to share those stories. Also, rather serendipitously, it turns out the incident commander for the East Moline tornado was the Rock Island County Sheriff. And as it so happens, his wife is the congressional representative for Northwest Illinois. So from a political standpoint, I think we gained a couple little bonus points there. And from a training perspective, too, especially as, as we transition a focus to impacts, it's important uh, for forecasters and interns to get out and see uh, what sort of things have happened. What does the damage look like? Uh, how do the people feel? How are they impacted? To kind of make what we're doing in the operations real. Of course, the outcome, our initial stats there were really good. In fact, I think this was one of the best tornado performances we've had in recent years. Uh, we got lucky with no fatalities. I think there was a couple of minor injuries, but no fatalities there. So to wrap up, I think uh, our performance in this event was a result of the synergy uh, of all these factors coming together, uh, starting with the uh, appropriate use of NWP. And granted, in this case, the model forecasts were right on, and we know that's not always going to be the case. In fact, more often than not, it's not going to be that good. So for forecasters to have skill in adjusting the models appropriately is key, because that's the first domino to fall. And then getting our staffing right, getting the numbers we needed to do the job, putting the right people in the right position was important. Uh, we've seen the benefit of the transition uh, to our ops layout. We used to have the circle of the wagons set up. Uh, with everybody's back to each other, and we've just seen that was just a, really a disaster, to be honest. So we've seen some benefits from that. And then a couple of the new tools, the rotation tracks from MRMS, uh, the push to use the higher elevation angle data near the RDA, and the use of spectrum width all combined to allow us to squeeze more information out of the radar than maybe we would have in the past. And with that, I'll take any questions.